everyone, I'm pleased to welcome you in this new series of 30 Minutes With. We are still in Ghana interviewing a lot of interesting people. So today we are at Jamestown to discuss with Accra.org. And 30 Minutes With, as you know, is a series of interviews on current African issues. So today we are here at Jamestown at Brazil House with Manche Ayekwe. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for having me. So today we are going to discuss about the collective that you co-founded, Accra.org. Yeah. So first of all, why this name? Um, well, we, we wanted to create an alternative space for um, any creators and also creators around the continent um, where we can, you know, create that information but also have support um, that will lead to these creations being viable. Um, you know, creating that opportunities for the artists who are involved, you know. Um, so setting up a crowd of what would say a reaction or a response to lack of opportunity and lack of infrastructure uh, within Ghana that supports um, creative enterprises and creative work. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so why in Ghana's places should why a crowd of both? It seems so futuristic. Um, well, you know, I, I think it's important for us to imagine a different reality continuously um, and then create this reality that we want to live in. You know, so the Ghana space taking is mainly a space for us to create without inhibition, you know, allow people to train, you know, mainly because they, there's such a critical lack within the space. Um, and then also um, just having a space where artists can have a voice. You know, because you know, within our society, like art and creativity is is almost missing, you know, or there's a very um, contested relationship, you know between art and the state or art and the society. So we more or less created the space to sort of like create a parallel infrastructure that was not available um, to absorb the creative voices and people who really were about their art, you know, and also creating community. Um, which, you know, for a long time was missing, mm -hmm. you know, in Ghana, all within a crowd when we was new operation. So, since, and also, a crowd of all became an entity in 2010, but really, um, our organizing and um, interaction with creative centers and artists within Ghana um, goes back to 2005, 2006, okay. you know. Um, so our crowd of all is, is, is actually it coming together was a result of you know years of work and research and interactions with people and then that's how we figured that one there is no space for artists to congregate and to create and also um, there was a total lack of infrastructure support um, from the state so we yeah, we started to set it up to one, fill that niche, and also um, to be able to create an art economy, you know, within Ghana, which I think that uh, we are sort of halfway through doing. Yeah, so that, I mean, those those were the main reasons why we set up. And how many people are you? Who are the people behind that? Um. So there's a core team of seven. Um, myself, um, I'll call it uh, and then five other people who man various aspects um, from design to um, management um, to running. Um, in the community. Um, but then, outside of the core team, there are a number of creatives that we work with throughout the year. You know, either be it on the festival or at the design shop or 
um, running um, commercial gigs, you know, which is how we fund uh, most of what we do. On your website, mm -hmm. I saw that uh, the, one, of the, one of your main initiatives, the Charlie Wooden Street Art Festival, mm -hmm. is described as an alternative platform that makes art, music, and dance performance out of the galleries and out of the street of Jamestown. So this uh, participates what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. It's about democratic, democratizing space mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. bringing down the boundaries between the different forms of expression. expression. Yeah, I mean, very much so. Also, there's a... For a long time, art wasn't something that you find in Jamestown. <gasps> You know, you probably have to go to a city hotel or a movie clinic or go to one to see, you know, an art exhibition. And it's usually, you know, by invitation. And it was, yeah, super elitist and stuck within a particular paradigm that most people, one, had no relationship with, and also, had no access to um, So Chalawati was really about deconstructing these white cube spaces and reinterpreting them in a space like Jamestown, which is the oldest um, part of the um, It's also a bit of a marginalized community, you know, and where else to set up something of that sort but amongst people who really need to have access to art. Are you from Jamestown? Um, not originally. Not originally, but um, I mean, if you're gone, you're, uh, like your roots will be in Jamestown. So, yeah, a long time ago, my family probably lived somewhere around in Jamestown. But I'm not from here, but then I'm from I'm from one of the clans within Jamestown. Okay. My family is from one of the clans okay. within Jamestown. But I mean, I wasn't born and raised here. Um, but then, yeah, it was, it was more about making art accessible, you know, and more interactive. And then, you know, because over the years, like, artists have been stuck in these white queer spaces and it hasn't really had an impact, you know, on the community. And five years after Charlie Wote, um, four of West Africa's biggest artists now, actually the biggest artists out of the continent now, four of them are from Africa. Um, and what does Tony look at me? Why the choice of that name? Well, well um, everybody has a, which I don't want to originally, when you ask any Ghanaian what Tony would think, they'll tell you flip flops. You know, that's what we call flip flops. And every person in Ghana outside of their social status has a relationship with flip flops. You know. But then Chale One it's it's a slang we use over here for friend or buddy. And what it is Ga, which is the language spoken in Greater Africa. And it's Ga for let's go. So it's like man or friend, let's go. Um, it's also um, because of what it means and what it stands for. It's also something that sort of binds people together. It's yeah. yeah. Um, so we use we sort of repurpose Chalawate um, for the festival, but then also like five years down the line, when you actually talk about Chalawate now, they're not talking about flip flops. The first thing they talk about is art. You know. So we've managed to like repurpose a common slang. Or something that everybody has a relationship with to mean something else. So now, like on, in different parts of the continent where people are aware of Chalo they don't know it. That when you say Chalo Wote, the first thing that comes in their head is not, you know. Um, so, yeah, and of course, we had to we had to have a Ghanaian name. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, those people are pretty important. And how does the community of uh, Jamestown relate to Chalo um, I don't know if if you if you came here earlier, you could see that there was a music video. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, 
So most of the people, you know, they, they will come and ask to shoot um, in our space uh, because of the photographs and the paintings or shooting the yard. Um, and then most of the time we're working with people in the community to set it up. Chadwick is a very community-based um, festival. Um, so we're working with community artists, uh, we're working with community security people, we're working with community logistic people, community caterers. You know. So outside of it being um, something that has economic value for them, there's also this participation, you know, in this exciting fun fair where people from all walks of life and people from all across the world are coming here. Um, you know, to congregate and, and celebrate art in a way that is most unusual, you know. So, yeah, we have massive support within the, the traditional authorities within the community and also just, you know, the people who work with people like this, you know. So we're connecting with um, other collectives in the West Coast of Africa, particularly Nigeria. Um, we're connecting with um, East African collectors, you know, be it Rwanda, um, Kenya, um, or artists in Zimbabwe, or Mozambique, or South Africa, you know. Um, so, I mean, throughout the continent, we, you know, we have some pretty good footprints and connections with other organizations and you know we're continuously discussing um, ways in which we can support each other and also ways in which we can um, you know we can feed into what each other is doing. Um, so when our state uh, our states are still discussing regional integration you are making it happen. Yeah yeah <laughs> I think that I think that regional integration it can happen faster to the you know, than through politics. And I think it's already happened. I think, yeah, the politicians, they drag their feet too long and there are all kinds of interests at stake. Um, but I think that for cultural producers, we understand, you know, the magnitude of um, what we're dealing with. And also there's, there's more of a sense of urgency um, to implement um, some of these things. But in the long run, you know, it, it, you know, the, the things that will outlive us, you know, and, and I think that's that's important, creating infrastructure that will outlive our existence and people who come 20, 30 years from now, they can build from where we left off, you know, and understanding that, you know, we can't build in isolation, you know. Synergies. Yes, yes, synergies are extremely important. And we made some very, very, Connection. Why Ghanaian artists, creatives can't earn a decent living? <laughs> Most of them. I don't um, say not yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's real. Uh, it's real. It's real. real. Um, first of all, I think it comes down to the way artists talk to within the school system. Um, and also the kind of relationship that we have with art community. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so, after 1966, when Kwame Nkrumah was on the throne, there was a systematic dismantling of state infrastructure that supported art, you know, and because his government understood the importance of cultural production. Kwame um, Nkrumah was very instrumental in highlight music becoming a big thing globally. So he would travel with highlight musicians everywhere. Really? Yeah, and, he, and they would play everywhere he went, you know. And so he made it a point to take, you know, visual artists, photographers, and musicians with him all the time. Um, and then, I mean, if you understand the politics that had gone his overthrow, it was basically um, the US Central Intelligence Agency disrupting a socialist revolution, basically. Um, and then with him going away, everything that he created and supported also was also decimated. So we you know we've never had since that time we've never had 
any sort of stage also out that sort of even casually nurtures the artist, you know. Um, so then it's affected how people are taught, you know, and then even the ways in which they are taught is very Eurocentric, you know, so you're learning about European artists and you have you know, people with PhDs, they come out and they, they are really curious about what pertain within the continent or even within their own country and they can speak all kinds of English about European artists and North American artists, you know. Um, there's also a coloniality that is attached to that. Um, and then, what art is? Yes. Who defines what exactly, art exactly. is? Exactly. 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 You know, so you have, you know, Ghanaians who perpetuate um, the same ideologies that settler colonialists are invested in, you know. And, and that has affected how we relate to art and even how seriously we take it. You know, we're just beginning to see an awakening. It's, you know, we're witnessing a renaissance, really. You know, so maybe next time you come here, there will be a lot more people who are profiteering off of their art. Um, there are a lot more curators who know what to do, who know what to art to set up for collectors. Um, and then, you know, people will also begin to understand the business of it. You know, that it's not just about certain art, but then, you know, there's a very particular type of market and it has very particular demands, you know. And then, you, you know, we're beginning, we're just beginning to understand that. We're that is a kind of contradiction. Like, mm -hmm. Ghana has a cultural policy, mm -hmm. has cultural yeah. institutions, yeah, and so on, yeah. but that, it seems like there is a kind of dichotomy, or they don't talk to people who really do art. Well, they are out of trust. They are out of trust. There's a disconnection between policy makers and people who are actually practicing. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, we have a very fancy document for cultural policy, but um, in reality, it's not being implemented. Um, and I think that you know, the people who are put in charge of these things, it's they have other things that they prioritize, you know, other than cultural production, really. So. Yeah, and that's what I really and it you know it takes a particular type of political will to say we're going to focus here and we're going to invest money into it and then we're going to look for results. You know, um, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but hopefully um, the state will come to understand how important culture is in propelling the country towards. Um, particular developmental goals, mm -hmm. and also the <laughs> like the economy within art business is is extremely profitable if you get it right, mm -hmm. extremely profitable, mm -hmm. and it's actually something that we can own. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like a mineral mm -hmm. that you have to invite foreign investors mm -hmm. to come in. Mine, and then you're getting five percent of something that people are making billions of dollars off of. This is like something that we are creating, you know, and we are not decimating the environment to create it, you know. And there's, I mean, if it's money they are interested in, there's there's billions to be made if we just really make a plan, you know. But currently, I'll say that there is, um, I mean, there's lip service, but there isn't active involvement and interest in propping up cultural production or art production for that matter um, by the state, you know. So, I mean, that's why organizations like Nubuke or Akrada or Anno or um, the Studio um, Foundation for Contemporary Art Ghana. Um, that's why organizations are like that are important because they are they are doing what the state is supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Really. Um, so yeah, I mean, at some point, I hope that we can engage the state more seriously and they can be um, 
the political will to support and not just, you know, making public statements or we're going to do such and such and, mm -hmm. you know, four years down the line there's nothing to show. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, I personally feel like, you know, this sort of state structure that we have is not designed to support these kind of things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it makes sense that five years down the line we're having our sixth um, uh, festival and, you know, there is no significant support from the state. And well, to be fair, you know, the city authorities, which is an arm of the state, the AMA, um, they allow us to block the yeah, that crime metropolitan assembly. Okay. Um, they allow us to block um, a major access route, okay. High Street, mm -hmm. um, for the festival, and they give us um, security um, city guards mm -hmm. um, who reroute traffic throughout the city. So on that level, I'll say um, the city authorities within Accra have been quite generous in um, you know supporting us not with cash but you know just allowing us to block a major access route you know like high street is 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 a major access route throughout the city and they allow us to block it and they give us city guards to reroute the traffic so yeah on that on that level yeah there is that kind of relationship with That's the city relationship. yeah um, but then beyond that, you know, um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's more room for improvement and more room for conversation. Really. Yeah. How about the private sector? Because I saw that at one of the festivals, mm -hmm. there were, I don't know if it was mobile network operators or someone who were there selling their own stuff and they were not invited, making yeah. profit and so on. So. Do they support you? What no, are your partners? No, How? no. There's um, but the private sector here, I don't think they know what to do with art. Mm -hmm. I don't think they understand it. I don't think. I think they're clueless mm -hmm. as to what to do with it. But then they realize that oh well, so many people are here, so we can sneak in mm -hmm. and uh, sell products and make a profit. Um, but we've had. We've had some major issues, you know, with corporations who stole their way into the festival. Um, we're still, I mean, we're taking legal action. Um, so I don't want to, like, talk about it. But um, I don't think that we're, we're interested in dealing with corporations who are only here for profit and exploitation, you know and will not support something but then will steal their way in to make a profit, you know. Um, yeah, we're not interested. Uh, and also, I mean, we've been on our own all this while. So, yeah, when we find organizations who align with what we do and we treat the festival with respect um, and approach us for partnerships, yeah, we're open for that kind of conversation. Um, but yeah, not with people who just want to exploit artists there because so they don't have time. Let's discuss about your other initiatives. Mm -hmm. Apart from Chale Wote, you have Sabolaya Radio, which yeah. is the largest African music uh, showcase in yeah. West Africa. Yeah. Africa. West Africa. Maybe Africa. <laughs> well, I mean, we like to say West Africa because that's what we're asserting of. Okay. Yeah. So, can you tell us about this uh, festival and the different editions you've had so far? Um, so, Sabalai Radio is actually older than Chale Wote. Okay. Um, it's a year older because that started in 2010 um, under the name Indifuse. <laughs> so, Sabalai Radio came up as a response to um, artists neglect really um, and also the way and manner in which you know DJs had made themselves gatekeepers deciding on what was good music and what wasn't um, 
and then also creating a system of privilege where you are able to access based on how much you can pay to get your music on the air. Um, so for a long time, you know, artists were dealing with that, and then they, you know, there weren't spaces for people to perform or to create. So everyone is waiting for that one big show, so we can all rush on it. And sometimes people are paying to get on shows, you know. Um, also because you know these artists, really all they are thinking about is getting their music out and people noticing that. You know, um, so actually for 2010, a lot of our talk party gatherings were centered around creating spaces for alternative and new music. I was about to ask that question, but maybe you can explain what the talk party yeah. are at the same time. Yeah, so, so at, at the talk party, we it's basically like a, an idea incubator. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's a gathering of um, creators and artists and creative professionals, basically, one to discuss um, ways of making our country viable um, and also creating projects. So, Indiefuse, New Shirts and Kim Savala Radio, was one of the projects that came out of the talk party after months of discussion and also deciding um, the kind of music that we support, you know. And we realized that there was so much that wasn't on the radio for various reasons. And we could just create a space and have these people come and share the music. So that's how it actually started as a platform for um, Ghanaian and West African musicians, you know who couldn't find community or find spaces where their music could be heard, you know. And that was, I mean, that was the main reason for setting up um, um, Sabolai Radio. And does Sabolai have a particular meaning? Sabolai in Ga means onion. Onion? Yeah. Okay. Um, but we're, we're looking at it as a uh, multi-layered mm -hmm. um, structure mm -hmm. and also something that is prevalent throughout all of Africa, particularly West Africa. Like mm -hmm. our, our food is yeah. made up of onions, <laughs> yeah. you know, from Accra to Dakar. Mm -hmm. um, onions make up a huge part of our diet and also for ceremonies, for ritual. There's a, there's a cultural status attached to mm -hmm. onions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and we thought that, you know, this multi-layered thing, you know, also represents um, just the flavor of the music, you know, and how complex it is, but then also how also connected the music is. Um, you know, we decided to use that um, as a way to represent the music or what the music is good for, you know. So we discussed about Chai Wante, Sabalaya Radio, the talk party series. Is there any other activities that you are promoting right now? Um, so, well, at the moment we have. Um, we curate, um, we have a an art sale called Jala Boutique. I'm sorry? An art sale mm -hmm. called Jala Boutique. Jala Boutique. Yeah, okay. where we curate the works of um, emerging artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, we set up an exhibition, mm -hmm. and at the end of the exhibition, um, we do an art sale. Mm -hmm. Primarily targeted at young Ghanaians who are interested in art and who are interested in collecting, you know. So it's, um, it's for now, it's a, it's a small program that is looking to create a buyer and collector base within Ghana, you know, before we start um, looking out, you know. Because that's actually how you can create a sustainable economy, you have to have people domestically who will support the art or put their money into the art before um, people from outside. Such that, you know, we don't want to have a market that is hinged on an external market to thrive, you know, because there are people, there are wealthy people here and there are, you know, young people with disposable income, you know, and if you can 
If you can spend two, three hundred dollars on a weekend having a good time, you can spend like a hundred or one hundred and fifty dollars and collect some art. You know, that way you're also supporting somebody else's practice and you're able to create more. You know, if you're able to do that consistently and grow it exponentially, you have a market on your hand that is domestically supported and you know once you have that people are more interested in you know in that kind of trade you know or setting up um collecting businesses and, stuff like that. and i mean now there's a there's a new gallery um that's been set up um it'll open in march gallery 1957 and um they're working with um a lot of artists that we work with. Um, yeah, the current curator is um, is an artist that we've worked with over the years. Um, the exhibitions they've had, all the artists, you know, are trying to work artists also. So we, the scene is growing gradually, and the market potential is also expanding gradually, you know, and and soon, you know. People, a lot more people will be able to live as artists, you know. So you've successfully launched and uh, nurtured all these initiatives. But now, if you have to look back, what were the main challenges that you faced? What are you proud of? And what are your future projects? Um, <clears throat> that's the challenges they, you know, they fluctuate. Sometimes they add on, sometimes <laughs> depending on the climate. Um, but I think the the major thing that we've dealt with is the lack of funding, you know, um, and the way that we we dealt with that is to continuously come out of pocket, continuously use our own money to support what we do. Yeah, so um, I think that could certainly be better. And we're happy that we've been able to think up these concepts and rock them to life. Um, and that these concepts, you know, the entire video or television or talk party has directly impacted people's lives and transform communities and create opportunities and create jobs for people. You know. So we I mean we are we are keenly excited about that and then the future prospects of having these structures be consistent, you know, and what they stand to transform, you know, within the community and, and within the country itself. They um in Kumasi they they are beginning a sort of art festival now. Really? Within um, the school, you can use to complement your science and technology. Um, so people see possibilities in art now. You know? And then next time another region would want to do something, suddenly there's it's an understanding that you can transform your community through art, you know, and it can make money for you, which is what, you know for communities that are marginalized. That's the first thing that comes into their mind. Like, can we make money off of? Of course you can, you know, and if you do it right, you can make more money off of it, you know. So that, you know, we're happy about being able to create the possibility that it impacts the lives um, of people throughout the city and throughout the country. Um, and then, you know, and just, you know, being happy to be a part of that transformation, you know, I think for us, that's, that's the kick we get out of it. You know, that we are part of this really life changing and life transforming world. Um, or historical period that is happening within um, getting art. You know. um, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I, 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 we spoke about everything. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having us. And um, you should come to Chaliwate when you have time in August. Um, it's really amazing. 
and so we, initially we were having it um, at different times of the year. Um, but two years ago, we decided to move it to August and leave it there. But it also comes a week after the traditional festival of the Ghana State, which is Carnival. Mm -hmm. So, what we've done in the last two years is to sort of incorporate bits of it into the festival. So, during Hall Hall, we have tours, um, which is something that we've done in the community. In 2012, we, um, we trained seven people, mm -hmm. um, just informing them on the history, the settlement and political history of Jamestown. Um, and four years later, there are over 40 tour guides mm -hmm. in Jamestown who are making money off of just giving tours mm -hmm. to tourists, mm -hmm. you know. And this, I mean, it goes, is money that goes directly into the community mm -hmm. and it's creating very direct jobs, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, what we do is that we, we have different, well, smaller programs during the traditional festival. Mm -hmm. Um, but then what it does is that it brings people out to see the traditional festival and then also leads up to channel meetings. Mm -hmm. So you have um, like two weeks mm -hmm. of activities, um, traditional ceremonies, rituals, um, and processions by traditional authorities and then the following week you get to see some art. Mm -hmm. so, um, if you know, things go right and we get a right investment, like Jamestown is on the cusp of becoming the cultural production hub, mm -hmm. or not just a crowd, but the whole country. Mm -hmm. you know, um, so hopefully we, you know, be able to find some people who would invest, you know, who are not shy about, um, and we can actually start turning the space around and also creating a new economy, which this country is lying for actually. Thank you so much, Monche, for having us. This was a very inspiring conversation. Thank you, uh, thank you for having me. About the Jamestown community, the Gap's history, and uh, congratulations for all that you have been able to do. Thank you, thank you. And I really hope I'll be able to attend the festival this year. You should, you should come. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's really exciting. If not for anything at all, just come and see the music and enjoy some kinky and fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. <laughs>